let's do this. Do you need um, a sound check or is that Is hum there a hum there? Is yeah, it's, it's making it so we don't go freeze, but I can turn it off now. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so okay. I'll just read out your bio. Mm-hmm. And then go through the book. Great. Are we recording? We are. Great. Hi, I'm Stephanie. Levels. Levels. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Susurrus sibilance. Susurrus sibilance. Now you can get levels. No, you see, you're confusing the microphone now. Really? Microphone doesn't know what you're talking about. I'm sorry, microphone. <laughs> I'm just trying to be helpful. Okay, hi. So, you've just heard from Stephanie Burt, who is a professor of English at Harvard University co-editor of Poetry at The Nation, and the recipient of the 2016 Guggenheim Fellowship for Poetry. A. A. They give a handful of them. I got A fellowship. Did I say the? You said the. Well, the most important one. The one that, <laughs> the one that went to you. Ah, uh, Certainly uh, grateful for it. Her work appears regularly in the New York Times Book Review, uh, the New Yorker, the London Review of Books, and other journals. She lives in... Massachusetts, that doesn't narrow it down. Is that a... I don't think I've seen that version oh, before. This is, this is the oh, that's okay. Advanced, now I see. That's advanced. the ARC. You've got an yeah. ARC. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Thank you for stopping by today. It's a pleasure. I'm pleasure. happy to talk with you about uh, you know how to read poems and how to avoid reading poetry. Very good. Well, that brings me to my first question. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, kind of a confrontational imperative uh -huh. of a title that you uh -huh. have there, Don't Read Poetry. Yeah. So why did, you, uh, why did you go with that? So I read a lot of poets and poems for fun and spend a good deal of time trying to help other people uh, get uh, you know, pleasure and intellectual reward and wisdom and, and delight out of various poems and, and poets in a classroom and as a writer. And I started thinking about what the barriers were to having my friends and having strangers discover and enjoy the poems they might enjoy. And I realized that one of the barriers is the idea that there's a single thing called poetry that has a single reason for being, or a single purpose, or a single thing it can do for you. And people don't, by and large, say that about music. We know what music is, right? It, it, it art forms that use sound and usually something besides words, whether or not there's singing, whether or not there are words, usually there's rhythm, often there's melody. We know what music is, and we can define poetry as an art form that does use words, where the words can stand without other aspects, like an actor speaking them or somebody playing the flute. We can define poetry as an art form, which is the definition I'm most comfortable with, mm. but that doesn't mean it always does the same thing, right? Uh, you might listen to Ornette Coleman this morning and, you know, Mecha Normal or The Pointed Sticks, if you remember The Pointed Sticks. Nope. Okay. No, no. Uh, I think they were a Vancouver New Wave band. They were really good. Anyway, um, Perfect Youth was the album. Okay. Uh, so you might listen to... Uh, you know, obscure low-tech new wave and out there jazz and, uh, you know, Brahms it's, it's, on the same day. Yes. On the same day and then to Beyonce uh, the next day. And you might like them all for different reasons and get different things from them. And nobody's asking Beyonce to be Brahms because you don't really listen to music. You listen to an individual artist or a song or to even a kind of music. You listen to free jazz. You listen to R&B. And for me, poetry is, is much more like music than people give it credit for. There's not one thing poetry should do. I like some poems for some reasons and other poems for other reasons. And that's one of the reasons, or meta-reasons, I spend so much time with composition in verse and poetic prose. And so I wanted to help readers and potential readers and listeners see poetry in more of the way that a lot of us already see music, which is it's not something you just go and defend or attack or make for one reason or in one way. And it's okay if you listen to music that is different from the music your teacher or your student or your best friend 
listens to, your tastes can overlap and not overlap, and that's also okay. There's not a linear scale of value in music, and it doesn't make a lot of sense unless you are a particular kind of indie snob to ask what is the best song ever. It makes a lot of sense to ask how does this song work? Why do I like it? What's it made of? Why does it work that way? Why does it do what it does to and for the people who like it? And that's the way I want to help people approach poems. So is that the role that you see for yourself as a critic, a literary Helping critic? people approach poems and find the poems that they like that would change and improve their lives. It's not the only thing I do as a literary critic, but it is the most important one. Yeah, I, I want to be able to connect people to poems that will make those people say, oh, wow, I didn't know life could be like that, or that sounds great, or that's startling and stunning and I'm not sure why, or, oh, now I know what to do with my feelings, or now I feel seen, or yeah. now I understand the world in a new way, or that's brilliant, I can't believe someone did that, all of which are reactions we can have to poems we like. Then I want to help people have those reactions. That's the most important thing that I can do as a, a literary critic, is helping people have those reactions. And, and that means mostly talking about and writing about poets who I myself admire and trying to demonstrate, not tell you so much as demonstrate uh, why I like them so much, in the hopes that you'll agree. But if you get from reading my writing tools with which you can enjoy what you enjoy, it's okay if that's not what I enjoy. What's interesting, though, is with music, it doesn't seem like people require someone like you to give them tools. Well, sometimes they do with orchestra music, with the kind of music that normally comes in sheet music. But what I'm getting at, though, is that a vast majority of people mm -hmm. don't require someone to push them into enjoying right, music. Right, right. People don't go around saying, well, I guess I don't like music because somebody you know, played them in the Rolling Stones once and... and they just, uh, they just, uh, everyone they just does music. like some kind of music, it right. seems. Well, no, I mean, Whereas not, very few right. or fewer right. people like some kind of poetry. It's a much smaller population. It is a much smaller population, and that is a contingent fact about modern U.S. and Canadian culture, not an intrinsic fact about the craft of verse or the art of poetry. And it comes about... And it's, it's less true than it used to be because of the way the internet works, but it comes about because poetry as an art form isn't central to much of our culture, and it's not something that can exist in the background, and it's not something that's just normally present in the home or in the newspapers um, or Whereas as, as music contemporary. Is, is and, much more, ex what, accessible? Is, yeah, or? music... Music is something, uh, pop music certainly, is something we don't have to learn about in school. Of course, you can study pop music in school, and I have, and that can be <laughs> worth doing, but you don't have to take a class in school to encounter a wide variety of music in popular song forms. Yeah, or to convince you that music is worth listening is to. Is worth listening to, right. And it's quite easy to find, once you start looking, times and places where uh, the art of poetry and the craft of verse are a part of popular culture and are a part of daily life. Uh, Irish culture is like U.S. culture and like Canadian culture in a lot of ways, but one difference is the centrality of verse composition to Ireland's self-image. Uh, you know, neither Canada nor the U.S. has a figure who is like Seamus Heaney, um, and, and we're, not, we're not likely to. Or, um, uh, although he's not a poet, his his prose reads like poetry. James Joyce is such a musical experience. So, Joyce has a wonderful ear and is a major modernist writer yeah. uh, and also a source of Dublin tourism. Um, he's great, but he wouldn't be part of this discussion because... But he's part of the he's, Irish discussion. He's though. part of the Irish discussion, but... I don't know that contemporary Irish people, the ones that I know, see him as a living chronicler of daily life, the way that to some extent Heaney was. I could be wrong. I could just know the wrong Irish people. Joyce also died a while ago. 
Yeah. Um, he did chronicle one particular day he, quite well, though. He did. He did. Um, you can find you can find U.S. writers and you can find Canadian writers uh, and you can find English writers who you could say have the same cultural position as as Joyce. You could talk about you could talk about Faulkner. You could talk about Alice Munro. You could talk about Toni Morrison. But if you're thinking specifically of the craft of verse and about poems that are short and quotable that people carry around in their heads, you know, the English had Larkin. I don't know that the U.S. has someone from the last 50 years who is like Haney or like Larkin. Um, and those examples happen to be white dudes. There's nothing necessary... Uh, about that role for a poet that says it has to be, uh, you know, a cis white dude, and the next one's not going to be. But we don't automatically get through popular culture exposure to some recent poetry in the way that we get it for pop music and for television making and filmmaking. Um, that's changing in some ways because of the ease of transmission for contemporary poetry over the internet. Uh, the internet is not a great way to read novels. No. Uh, people who love reading novels, and I love reading novels, seem to prefer to read them on uh, you know, rectangular objects made from dead trees. Um, but if, if what you want is 12 lines or 21 lines that encapsulate a feeling or introduce a character or embody a piece of wisdom, or demonstrate some impressive pyrotechnics with words. Mm. You can send that in email, you can put it on Tumblr. Sharing uh, is so easy. Isn't sharing, it? Yeah. sharing words, sharing small units made of words is very easy, and mm. so the internet has made it much easier than it used to be to discover poems. Uh, but, 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 but they tend to be... They tend to be contemporary poems, yeah. and they're often poems whose obvious links to older literature uh, are limited. They often appeal to young women, for example. I mean, yes, as did Jane Austen. I mean, there is, there is a depressing tradition of every new art form being disparaged by older authoritative people because its early adopters are teenage girls. Yes. Uh, for me, if yes. the early adopter of an art form uh, <laughs> appears to be young women, that is, you know, five <laughs> points in its favor. Um, right. And <laughs> of the people who've, who've come up mm. through Tumblr, through appearing to chronicle the exact moment that Generation Z, and in particular girls from Generation Z, uh, and queer people from Generation Z, uh, you know, only some of whom are girls, are experiencing. Some of those writers are aesthetically and intellectually interesting to me, like Hera Lindsay Bird or Patricia Lockwood, uh, and some are not, like Rupi Kaur. But Rupi Kaur's popularity s speaks to the enduring functions of wisdom literature and of, of lyric poetry. Um, and there are things Rupi Kaur is doing with the words that she arranges, which are then quoted by others as ways to express what it's like to be them, mm -hmm. uh, where the thing she's trying to do and that she seems to be doing for her admirers by arranging words artfully are often some of the same things that Li Bao uh, and that Sappho and that um, even in some ways uh, Alexander Pope was trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would rather read Pope, and I would rather read Sappho. Uh, but if, if you're, you're deprecating the kind of thing that Rupi Kaur is trying to do, no, uh, then you're not, not... I don't mean you personally. No, people no. Who, who think that, that, that she and poets like her and her audiences are somehow cheapening poetry or making it worse do not understand the history of the art form they're describing. Yeah. And, and, and are often just being sexist. I, I think you want to separate the content from the, the form. Oh, no, I don't want to separate the content from the form. Uh, no, but in her case, uh, uh -huh. if, if you're, uh, like, I don't think it's very good either, but I'm an old white guy, so... Uh -huh. and it well, I'm an old white lady. It doesn't uh, resonate with me, but uh, as I say, that what she's trying to do is to put 
words to feelings yeah. that many people have. To arrange words to feelings that many people have, which is, of course, what you know Samuel Daniel and Lady Mary Roth and... Um, Who's another good example? Thomas Campion are doing when they're writing sonnets in 1598. Mm, mm. Um, and a lot of Renaissance sonnets aren't actually that interesting, psychologically yeah. or verbally. Yeah. Um, Ruby Tower's working in very short forms, um, and often. And you know, I can find for you 20th century writers who are creating free verse... Uh, sometimes free verse specifically about women's and girls' experience in in short, quotable forms that, because of how poetry could be circulated at that time, wasn't popular until much later. I don't know if you're a Lurie Niedeker fan? No. Lurie Niedeker? Ooh, can I read you some Niedeker? Please! Lurie Niedeker is one of my... And we're rolling the dice to see if I've got my... Uh, Niedeker on on the shelf. Lurie Niedeker is an absolutely terrific. Here we go. Uh, this is the book that I'm picking up. Is not the edition you want to start reading her in, but it's something. Um, N i e d e c k e r. Okay. Uh, except for a brief time in New York visiting a poet she admired, which didn't work out that well. She spent her whole life in Southern Wisconsin. Hmm. By water, as she said, she's got a book called My Life by Water. Okay. Um, so what are you illustrating by reading her here? Uh, short forms geared to girls' and women's experience that are memorable, uh, that, that you, I That love. you think are good, okay. Yes, that yeah. I think are really good. And so why is this good and Rupi Kaur not good? Well, again... In your opinion. I, it's not my opinion, it's my reaction. Okay. It's whether I am moved. It's whether I want to reread this. Yeah. Hmm. And then you have to make the case that uh, that it is in fact worth reading to yeah, other people. Yeah, I, I, the, the, you know, one of my favorite critics, Randall Jarrell, said that uh, all the critics in the world couldn't prove that the Iliad yeah. is better than trees. Uh, all a critic can do is persuade, but that word persuade covers, and I'm still quoting Jarrell, everything from a sneer to statistics. Uh, I don't want to sneer. Uh, I don't especially want to use stats. Um, I want to read to people in ways that help them share my experience, and I, I have zero interest in persuading people to stop liking Ruby Cower. Zero. Yeah. I, 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 what I want is to help people like what I like. Um, let me... Oh, this is, this is lovely. Uh, this is poem that no one talks about by Niedeker, uh, and it's one of her poems of, of forest experience and meadow experience, On Hearing the Wood Peewee. This is my mew, as our days in a wild flying world last. Be alone, throw it over, all fashion, feud, go home where the green bird is, the trees where you pass to grass. Check out the acoustics on that. Um, Sounds very Japanese. Well, she had read haiku in translation. She had come from the the generation that that sort of grew up with modernist Japanoiserie. It's it's very Midwestern for Mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And it's very unprepossessing. So why why do you get excited about this? I love the aural patterning. Okay. Um, I find the feeling in it. Uh, and the compression, credible and admirable. Um, it presents a character and a life that I want to get to know more elegantly. And it, it makes you feel what? Um, happy, sad, fascinated, intrigued, moved, carried away, slightly uplifted, opened up, empathetic. So when you're in a sad mood, you like to read it? What kind of mood are you in when you'd like to read it? Um, I tend to go to Niedeker when I want elegance and compression and humility from the language that I... That that doesn't tell me the mood you're in, though. I read her when I am sad, and I read her when I am happy. I read her when I am busy. (laughs) That that narrows it down. Yeah, well, I'm not someone who needs poems to reflect the mood that I'm already in. 
No. There are. Does it? Do you need a like poem that. to get you out of a mood that you're in? That some. Yes, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. Right. right. Um, and she's actually, as a poet of humility, yeah. and as a poet who shows how much you can do with few words, a little time, not much in terms of resources, verbal or spatial or economic, not much confidence. Even she was not a confident person. So she's um, she's because she's in that way. Because she exemplifies humility, what do you like about the humility in it? It's not in your face. It's not trying to tell you anything. It's, it's, it's calm. It's, it's not necessarily calm, but it's a way of living in the world without feeling like you're asking for too much. Mm. A way of living with what you have, which being, I think a being lot satisfied. of us have. A way of being almost satisfied. A way of living with dissatisfaction. Right. Because she's always a little bit dissatisfied. Okay. I would not say that the world has treated me unjustly. I feel that I've gotten everything that, that I, you know, I, I feel okay about the way the world has treated me. Yeah. I don't feel okay about the way the world treated her, and neither did she, and yet she was able to approximate satisfaction by approximating or coming close to elegance, uh, to closure, to symmetry in her highly charged language. I will read you another poem of hers that's unusual in that it sums up uh, her really unusual but apparently happy second marriage. Um, And a lot of people, if you know someone, especially if you know someone in your life who's maybe at this point elderly and you're wondering how they're looking back on their lives, how they feel about choices that were the best ones they could have made, but not the best ones they could have had. It's a poem of retrospect. Again, it's a poem of elegance and compression. It's a poem, and I sort of get to this, the book Don't Read Poetry, which we've sort of gotten away from, is a book that gives sort of six different reasons why different poems can stand out. Uh, And the names I give the reasons are feeling and character, uh, technique and difficulty, wisdom and community. And this, which is Niedeker's poem, and I'm just sort of opening books of Niedeker's at random to find things that are appropriate. Mm. I'll read you a few. This is her, her poem on her second marriage, which was frustrating but made her happy. I married in the world's black night for warmth, if not repose, at the close, someone. I hid with him from the long-range guns. We lay leg in the cupboard, head in closet. A slit of light at no bird dawn. Untaught, I thought he drank too much. I say, I married and lived unburied. I thought, and then the poem is right there, because her life isn't, hasn't ended. And I'll give you some happier. I preferred that one to the first one. Okay. So we're okay. getting somewhere here. Sounds like we're having some trouble finding a poem that moves you. What are you looking for in poetry? How can I help you find what you're looking for? I think I'm looking to be amazed at, uh, if not if it's not the power or the beauty or the... I, I'm looking to be impressed with the way words have been put together. So How well do you know Merrill? Not that well. I should tell you who I... Uh, yeah, well, who are you already into? Yeah. Um, I, mean, I, I went and grabbed I, some Niedeker because we were talking about very short poems and about women's and girls' experience. Right. And about poems that were coming from a place that was not a place of privilege that I admire. Um, uh, I, you, I don't know that you would have heard of him. He's Canadian. And his name is Bruce Taylor. You know, I don't know that work. Um, um, and I feel bad because I... I, I like to think I try to keep up with Canadian poetry. Yeah, he's. I think he's superb. Let me see. Uh, Robin Robertson? Yeah, he's got a good ear. Um, he's, a, he's also an editor at Cape. He's very he? much an editor at Cape, yeah. yeah. My favorite Robin Robertson poems uh, have a narrative Sutherans. component. Oh, the... Uh, His great telling of the story of, of, it's, of Latin, of, of, of the fling of Marcius from Ovid, that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and he's very much a poet of landscape as well, the particular sort of Aberdeen Shire. Yeah. You know, he's talented. Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, if, if you want to be astonished by arrangements of language, uh, if you want to sort of marvel at somebody's technique, mm. um, you know what, let's try somebody else contemporary. How well do you know Terence Hayes? 
I do love his, uh, what are they, sonnets? Uh, the new ones. American yeah. sonnets for a past and future yeah, assassin. Yeah, I am yeah. impressed with That's certainly the, the most, uh, what's the pub date on that book? Um, and he does feature quite prominently in, uh, in yeah, Don't Yeah, he's, he's one of the figures along with Marion Moore and, and John Donne and yeah. uh, to some extent Adrian Rich who really recur in that book, who helped me yeah. think about the different things poems can do. Yeah. Should I read everybody a Hayes poem? That would be terrific. Okay. Um, this is from a book that came out in 2018 that was certainly, for me, the most important book of poetry from 2018. And it's a book of 14-line poems, some rhyme, some don't, called American Sonnets from a Past and Future Assassin. And it's Hayes' reaction to the Trump era. Yeah. Um, it's tremendously angry. It's tremendously varied. It is a demonstration of pyrotechnical verbal skill. Uh, it is a demonstration of, of uh, super brilliant person's intellectual and emotional restlessness. And you know what? I think I am going to read you the first sonnet in the book unless you Nigel are tired of 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 it no so this is the fr this is uh I, I I don't use this poem to make this point in don't read poetry but I could I, I talk about this poem in other terms instead but one of the conclusions that I come to are that you can read different poems for feeling uh that is helping you give voice to a, a state of mind that you might have, for character, introducing you to a person or a kind of person you might not already know who might be unlike you, for verbal technique, for challenge, for giving you wisdom, sort of helping you know what to do, and for community, for a sense of solidarity with, with others. Mm. Uh, those are six things you can get out of different poems. All the poems I like uh, have at least one of those desiderata, but the poems that seem to really last and to speak to and, and stick to a wide variety of people across space or across time, across decades or centuries, tend to do most of those things, and some of them even do all of them. And yeah, I would yeah. argue that Terence Hayes' recent books, most of all his new sonnet sequence, uh, belong to the company of, of, of poems and of books that really do all six of those things. They are poems of feeling, character, technique, difficulty, wisdom, and community. And this is the first poem from Terence Hayes' American Sonnets for my, past, for my Past and Future Assassin. And I'm going to slow down a little bit to get the resonance in those words. The black poet would love to say his century began with Hughes, or, God forbid, Wheatley, but actually it began with all the poetry weirdos and warriors, warriors, poetry whiners and winos falling from ship bows, sunset bridges and windows. In a second I'll tell you how little writing rescues. My hunch is that Sylvia Plath was not especially fun company. A drama queen, thin-skinned and skittery, she thought her poems were ordinary. What do you call a visionary who does not recognize her vision? Orpheus was alone when he invented writing. His manic drawing became a kind of writing when he sent his beloved a sketch of an eye with an X struck through it. He meant, I am blind without you. She thought he meant, I never want to see you again. It is possible he meant that, too. Yeah, that is so memorable. That is so memorable. I could talk about the poem all day. Yeah. I could talk about all the kinds of poem that it is and all the work that it does. And beautifully enunciated, too, I should say. Oh, uh, well, I hope so. I just tried to do the poem justice. Uh, you really got to hear Terrence Hayes read... Well, no, you don't have to. It is a good experience. It is a recommended mm. experience to hear Terrence Hayes no. read with his voice. But you don't have to. No, the reading it on your own just, is... Yeah. yeah, just read it slowly and listen to where the words... Read it out loud word. yourself. Read it out yeah. loud if you can, yeah. 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 Um, when you've been reading a lot of poetry, 
you find that, or I found that I can hear the words in my head without literally having to read them out mm-hmm. loud, mm-hmm. which is good when I'm reading poetry and it's 2 a.m. and everybody else who lives in my house is asleep because I don't want to wake them up. Yeah. Um, but it is good to hear poetry out loud and to read it out loud if you can. Yeah. Uh, and it does sometimes help to hear the poet's voice, but you don't have to. Well, that's why I appreciate the, the fact that you're reading these to us. Oh, thank you. I can read you more poems if you want. I can read you something old. Well, what uh, I what I want to do uh-huh. uh, though is uh-huh. I I couldn't read this book without thinking about your personal transformation. I'm um, I'm a trans woman. Yes. And Hi. Hi, listeners. I'm a trans lady. And. I thought okay, about. I, assume, I think that's what you meant. Maybe that's not what you meant. It is what I meant. Okay. And it, it what I was thinking about uh-huh. was how sort of Byron turns his life into a work of art, and I just wonder. I, I'm fascinated to learn from you. Is one of the reasons, perhaps, that you're doing this is to be able to see the world from a different perspective. Huh. Um, I mean, certainly poems And to help. be treated differently. So cer- when you say doing this, do you mean being a literary critic or transitioning? <laughs> Both. I'm being a literary critic because <laughs> I'm, I'm very extroverted and I like helping people enjoy what I enjoy. And I seem yeah. to be uh, you know, okay at helping people enjoy works of art made of words. And... Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be able to, to have a job that involves doing that. An imaginary alternate universe version of me that is born at the same time into the same place with the same parents and the same you know opportunities, uh, but who's a cis woman instead of a trans woman, uh, would quite possibly still grow up to be a literary critic. Yeah. Um, I like doing this, and I really don't want the interest in my critical writing, whether I help people enjoy Terence Hayes or John Donne or Marianne Moore or whoever, no. I don't want that interest to depend on my life story. It really no, and I, and I don't typically go to, to no. a person's no, personal no, that's life. Okay. However, you, it just struck me again, this I, whole yeah. idea of uh, reading poetry, uh, trying to understand what things are like yeah. from a, another completely different person's yeah. perspective yeah. you are actually living that and that's what i found so interesting so, so i'm glad you found it interesting and it seems like you like the book i'm glad you like the book um i think that that many poems and poets and kinds of poems do help us try on different kinds of perspectives and emotional lives and psyches Mm -hmm. and metaphorical bodies, metaphorical bodies that are not our own. There is a way in which, and my colleague Helen Vendler has said this in another connection, uh, I think it's implicit in other critics, it's implicit in George Manning Hopkins, it's, you know, not an original idea to me. There is a way in which the text of a lyric poem, and not all poems are lyric, no. uh, is a kind of substitute for the speaking body of the poet. Instead of having a speaking body physically present to you in the room, you have a poem. Instead of tone of voice and body language and physical presence, you have arrangements of language and overtones and implications uh, that help reinforce or sometimes undermine or change the meaning of the words. Uh, so there's a way in which Many poems do substitute for a speaking body. There's a sense in which many poems do allow writers and readers to try on various psyches, identities, backgrounds, dispositions, ways of being in the world and in language and and of having a spirit. Um, My experience as a literary critic... Uh, just trying to explain how poems work and to discover how poems work and why I like what I like hasn't been directly about being trans or about transitioning. My experience as a poet has. Um, I thought I was, as as someone who publishes poems by me, uh, I thought I was writing poems that were very obviously about being a trans girl uh, long before I I was out. Uh, And I was surprised that people didn't really see that that was what the poems were about. But I don't want the interest or the power or the success in my literary criticism to depend on people liking my own poems. 
either. And I, I, I don't, I hear you saying that being trans is about trying on various identities to see which ones fit. No, that's what I'm saying. Right. This is, it's much, obviously, it's much uh -huh. more fundamental than that. It's something that you can't help, I would think. It, no, it, it's not. You can be closeted or you can come out. You can be happier or sadder, but, but you don't, no one decides to be trans. Exactly. People decide to come out. Right, but what I'm saying is that that feeling is there. Yeah, you can't invent it. I'm not suggesting right. you're inventing this know, just as an experiment. I know. What I'm saying though uh -huh. is that it's happening in your life. You are experiencing the world as two different people. So honestly, I'm not. Um, so well, sorry. Then let let me back that up uh -huh. and say. Maybe you're being treat. Are you being treated by the world differently as two different people? So, I'm being treated. I mean, uh, no. Um, okay. My experience and and every you know every trans person has a different story. You can absolutely find people who are, are willing to talk about their transition who says yeah who say yeah I became a different person. You can right. find some of us who treat the day they started hormones or the day that they changed their pronouns as, as if it were their birthday, as the start yeah. of a new life. Yeah. Um, that has not been my experience. Well, uh, no. In fact, I know, for example, you have, a, you have another book, recent book, about... Uh, describing and interpreting 60 poems, I think yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. And um, you don't care if it's Stephanie or Stephen on the book. Well, no, I, I actually do care, uh, but I care, and, and when I sign Or it doesn't the, make that much difference to you? It is more, it is much more important to me that people read and come to love Alan Peterson and C.D. Yes, Wright and all yes. these other poets okay. uh, than that my correct and current name is on the book. Okay. But uh, when I sign copies of my older books, which were printed yeah. with, uh, you know, my dead name on them, I do get a Sharpie and fix the name because I'd rather people call me by the correct name and gender me correctly. And, yeah. you know, being misgendered is annoying okay. um, and, okay. and sad, and I don't want that. Yeah. Uh, but it, 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 there are things that I w was trying to do with my life before I came out and transitioned that I am still trying to do afterwards, yeah. uh, whether they are helping you know, people read John Donne or trying to be a good parent, you know, or trying to be an effective teacher who puts my students first. Um, I was doing that in 2008 when yeah. very few people knew I was a girl. I'm doing that now uh, when people seem to know. Um, I'm much happier now, uh, but the project continues. And my experience of my own life, since you asked, uh, is not an experience of becoming a different person at all. It's an experience of just being better. Um, You're being more honest with yourself? Being more honest with myself and having more fun. Uh, and no longer being annoyed every day by the sense that, you know, my body and, and the visual impression I make on people is, is the wrong one. I mean, yeah. do you know anyone with chronic knee pain? Anybody who's got like an ACL injury they didn't treat? No. So there, I'm, I'm addressing this because you brought it up and it's relevant to asking about my life as a writer. And then we can go back to, to the, the, my, to my new book, which we're, talking about, but it, yeah. it does seem, if, for, if listeners have gotten this far, my experience of living somewhat closeted, of, of trying to be something other than visible as a woman, uh, was not an experience of, of not existing. It was not an experience of pain I could never live with. It was not unlivable, but it was an experience of living it less than my full self. Right. And it was like living with, there's something wrong with you, but you choose not to treat it because you don't think it can be treated. And you just go on and, and you have as good a life as you can and you honor your commitments. And You're you putting up with at, the pain. Putting up with the pain, right. Some people just go through life and they feel like they can't do anything about it, but their knee hurts. Yeah. I went through life and I couldn't do anything about it and my gender hurt. Uh, and it turns out that you can fix that. Yeah. And I'm very grateful to the people around me who, and the people I've met 
through coming out and being myself, some of whom are poets and, and literary scholars and some of whom are not, uh, and a su surprising number of whom, I'm, I'm not surprised anymore, but I, I used to be, are either uh, novelists or comic book people who have been helpful and, and now, you know, my gender doesn't hurt and, and I'm, I'm, much, okay. I'm much better. And you're a probably person. a better literary critic now because all your energy, or a better teacher because all of your energies are now being focused on... So I think I'm a better teacher. I don't actually think I'm a better critic. Uh, I don't think I'm a worse critic. No. But I don't, I think that the, the ability to write about somebody else's life on their terms, in their language, and sort of live inside their head, that is a profoundly disembodying activity. Yeah, but I'm thinking, and, and for it, example, mm -hmm. you're, you may have been free, being able to free up more brain power that's or possible, yeah. creativity or whatever it is. That's, that's possible. That's possible. I wouldn't say that, but if that's your impression of my work, I wouldn't try to talk you out of it. And thank you. <laughs> Um, should we, if you have more questions about being trans, I will answer them. No, for no, no, I, I, Land, no, no, I think the, the focus, the focus, uh -huh, uh, I don't, uh -huh. yeah, I don't want to dwell on it. It was simply that you talk in the book, uh, -huh. uh about being able to understand different points of view. Yes. Yeah, uh, and I, I, and as I say, you are kind of embodying a really interesting facet of that as it pertains to what you're talking about mm -hmm. in your book, that's all. So, But if there is anything in that vein that you can add to yeah, well, what there, you've there's... done with your life, I'd be interested <laughs> to hear about it. I'm very fortunate in the way that I've been able to become visible as a trans woman mm -hmm. in, in literature and in academia and in, in social life. Yeah. And I, I want to try to use that visibility to, to help other people who may not feel as safe or as seen or as supported. And the arts are part of that. Yeah. Um, and they're part of that for cis people too. They're part of that for allies. Uh, there are poems that can help you see yourself and hear yourself and find aesthetically satisfying realizations and representations of who you are. There are other poems that can help you find aesthetically persuasive and emotionally compelling representations of other people, of people who you are not. And it's important to me to be able to read both kinds of poems. Mm -hmm. And... The same poem that will show one reader herself will be encountered by another reader as a representation of someone who's not like them at all. There are, uh, who's a good example? Um, Richard Hugo, uh, the, the Pacific Northwest poet of the 70s and 80s, wrote poems that were about working class whiteness and uh, having a big male body and feeling at home in the Pacific Northwest and being a veteran, being someone who was shaped in part by war and feeling like the world hasn't quite given him what he deserves. Um, zero of those feelings are feelings that I have had. Right. When I read Richard Hugo, that is compelling language in the service of creating characters who are not me. When other which is people, which is enabling you to understand that yeah, different yeah, existence. Yeah, but, but for somebody else, they may be seeing themselves. And this way that poems can do Does that mean you things, can like it, though? Sorry. Oh, of course, yeah. Yes. I don't think he's a great poet, but I think he's a good one. Yeah. I think he's a good one. Yeah. Uh, and you know, many other people see themselves in him, right? Like, I'm, yeah. I'm a white lady. Uh, Langston Hughes... You don't have uh, to see is, yourself is, in it to like it. Of course, of course not, not, yeah. And this isn't just about demographics, right? It's, demographics are easy to talk about because you know whether you're... Canadian or not, you know whether you you have a, a, a you know visual disability or or whether you are have normally able eyesight. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are all kinds of other diversity that poems can can look at where some people are and some people aren't. You might be shy or extroverted. Mm -hmm. You might be loquacious or laconic. You might be uh, a research monster or who loves obscurity and weird words, or you might be someone who puts a high premium on plain speech and simplicity and accessibility for yeah. ethical reasons or emotional reasons. Yeah. Those are different kinds of identity also. And in each case, I can give you a poet who represents a psyche. 
someone who would speak to you or the other someone who could speak to you for you and someone who could show you a way of being in the world and show you in verbally interesting aesthetically effective terms a way of being that's that's not yours and so uh, there are obviously different reasons to read the poetry one would be to commune with people who have shared your experiences and see what may be difficult, what may be pleasurable in the same way that you do, and then yes. there's to find the opposite of that. Yes! To exp- and again, that's how, why I'm bringing the trans thing in here, yeah. is you're, tr- you're, you're able to, by reading poetry, see what it's like to be someone else, or try and empathize with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and having, you know, tried to be a guy when I'm not one, and then, uh, you know, being the woman I am, um, that experience of seeing somebody else's, ex- seeing how someone else experiences the world around sex and gender, mm. um, of, of I, you know, I, I'm not like that. It's interesting to know what that's like when I read someone like Bruce Smith, who writes beautifully about masculinity, or when I read poems about what it's like to be into guys, right? Yes, yes. Uh, whether it's somebody like Tom Gunn or Randall Mann or, or Doug Powell, D.A. Powell, who writes beautifully about gay male sexuality, but um, or obviously there's or, more on heter- heterosexual uh, sexuality, and this is what you've you are now, well not now, but this poetry that talks about the love of a man for a woman, or a woman now for a woman, for a man. Does that resonate more? It, it always resonated with you, I guess. But I now mean, you can actually live it. So, That's uh, what I'm thinking. I, if you go out <laughs> into the real world as a woman, and no one knows that you've been a man before, and you're going after a guy... Which I'm not. I'm, I'm gay. I, my partner's a woman. I date women. Uh, okay. Okay. So let's wind that back. That's okay. I'll I let date, you talk. Well, I mean, I'm into women and non-binary you... people. I uh, see. And we should... Non-binary poetry and non-binary experience is a whole other podcast <laughs> that you should absolutely do. That is an identity that's newly visible and that poets are doing a lot to, to make visible and create. I'm sorry. What was that again? I missed that. Non-binary identity. People whose pronouns are they, them, theirs. Oh, right. Who are, okay. are uh, you know, both a guy and a woman or yes. neither. You know what's so thing. interesting about this is uh-huh. that the indigenous people That's right. see, don't see it by uh, gender as binary. Oh. There's like, a whole range on the, on the it, scale. It, I mean, it depends who you talk to and what their nation is, but there are a lot of non-binary identities that emerge from different first people's cultures yeah. and in Samoa and in... Um, in in you know Maori language and culture and so on, and our um, culture just sees sees black and white. Well, we're or working. In, we're, we're working, working on, on that. We're working yes. on that. And yeah. and my friends, you know, I'm I'm very binary. I'm I'm a woman. Um, but my friends who are non-binary are working on how to represent that in a way that is sometimes feels ambassadorial, and yeah. sometimes feels like it's by and for and about people who are in that community. And again. The same piece of language, if it's memorable enough and beautiful enough, mm. um, can be a mirror for some one reader and a window, mm. or you know, a trip yeah. for another. And if, if and and part of what I want to do as a critic is help people find and enjoy and maybe come to love a wider variety of aesthetically interesting pieces of language. Well, let's. I know you're not uh, rushed to get somewhere, so we will leave. I it. do have an appointment, yeah. So, uh, and we haven't. I, I've read your book pretty closely. Thank you. I really appreciate uh, this kind of attention. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, and maybe at some other date we can actually go through it very closely together well, how, if you have the time. I mean, how long are you around? I, I do uh, have to go now, but if you want to do another half hour of air, we could do that later. Yeah, uh, I I want to spend probably another hour and a half on it. Oh, but uh, but, but we I I can come back to visit if you have the time. Yeah, we can follow up. We yeah. can. Okay. I've done podcast interviews that turned out to be two parters before. Sure. If if you want to put this on the air and and produce it and then yeah. do a part two when you're next in town. Yeah. We could absolutely do that. Very good. I'm 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 flattered that you've chosen to spend your time reading stuff by me. Um, is there anything uh, that, that you want to be sure to ask me this time? I can be a few more minutes late for my next appointment. Well, I'll give you the chance. Yeah, I want, as I say, the, I, we, we really just sort of listed the, the six various 
reasons to uh, uh, to read uh, poetry, poems. Uh, so I, I won't dig into that, but what I will dig into is the cover. Uh -huh. I'm thinking of Wordsworth's daffodils, and yep. you're, you're actually getting to the root of <laughs> his daffodils. Or, or plucking them. I mean, that's, or pulling them out, yes. That, so what, uh, what's the story behind that? The story behind that is that the, the brilliant design team at Basic Books came up with it yeah. and said, this should be your cover, we love it, and they showed it to my partner, who I trust on visual matters more than I trust myself, and she said, that looks great. Yeah. And I said, okay, uh, you have confirmed my priors on this. That looks great. Let's go with this. And did, you, did you think, once it was selected, did you then sort of retroactively put some interpretation on it? Of or? course. Well, they had read the book. Yes. Uh, it is a reference not just to Wordsworth's Daffodils, but to a, a serial comic poem by Jennifer Chang, C-H-A-N-G, that is about Dorothy Wordsworth, Word, William Wordsworth's sister, yeah. who, who was a really co-creator with him on not necessarily his most famous individual poems. He wrote them, she didn't write them, but mm. on his vision, and she was a very talented writer herself. Mm. And, and she was integral to the way that Wordsworth saw the world, especially when he was writing his best known and, for me, also his best poems. Mm. So and Jennifer also, I Chang, the philosophy of his poetry, too, no? She, they spoke a lot together on Long Walks. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. They shared ideas. Um, so Jennifer Chang's poem about Dorothy Wordsworth and Wordsworth looking at daffodils and whether major poets are always self-absorbed and what use beauty is and how to do justice to the variety of experience around daffodils and being named Wordsworth and going for walks rather than accepting one interpretation of one poem by one poet as the only way. Mm -hmm. uh, Jennifer Chang's sort of really honestly funny and snarky poem about Wordsworth and Daffodils and Dorothy. I discussed that in the book, and the design team decided to put an uprooted daffodil on the cover, I think, for that reason. So it's a fun cover. I'm very happy with it. The whole experience of being published by Basic has been great. I've been very lucky with all of, all of my presses, honestly. Grey Wolf does my poetry. Uh, Harvard and Columbia and now Princeton are doing other books. Mm -hmm. I've been really happy with just how I've been treated, and how I've been treated by Canadian journalists and editors as well, in, in case you were going to bring that up. And I will go read Bruce Taylor. I regret not knowing I'll send you his, if I can get a hold of a copy of his first book, I will send one to you. Please do. Yeah. I do need to go now. Very good. Thank if you If you want to so do much. this again later, I'm um, uh, I do. narcissistic enough to okay. enjoy the attention. Very Thank you. Good. Okay. I'll be talking to Stephanie Burt, who is a professor at Harvard and a literary critic at mm -hmm. Harvard University. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Okay. okay. I, I hope that really was fun. For me? Yeah. Okay. I gotta get out of here. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye.